And if you would, turn to Matthew chapter 16, verses 24, 25. We're continuing with our series looking at the parables of Jesus. Those amazing word pictures that Jesus paints for us, illustrating who he is, what he's done, how we might respond to who he is and what he's done. We're going to look at a parable proper, but a parable given in two illustrations this morning. We're going to look at the tower builder and the warring king. Get more into that in just a moment. But I want to begin with the words of Jesus in Matthew 16, verses 24, 25. Hang on tight. Listen to this. Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 16, verse 24. And Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Yowzers. Father, thank you for, thank you for the clear instruction of your word. Jesus, thank you for hard truths such as this that you spoke to your disciples, that you're speaking to us today if we want to follow you. We've got to deny ourselves, whatever that looks like. We must pick up our cross, whatever that looks like. We must follow you. Jesus, would you speak to our hearts this morning? Would you speak to our hearts? May I not get in the way of what it is you want to speak to us this morning? And we thank you for that. In your precious name, amen. Amen. What a radical challenge. If anyone wants to come after me, you want to follow me, you want to be my disciple, you've got to deny yourself, you've got to pick up your cross then you can follow me. Unfortunately, that's not the last difficult statement we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at some of those hard words of Jesus that he spoke throughout his earthly ministry to his disciples, and he is speaking to his disciples today. What a rad radical challenge. You want to follow me? You've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross and you've got to follow me. Truly following Jesus requires radical commitment. Is that an understatement? As we look at those words of Jesus. Jesus' words and those that we're going to look at this morning honestly kind of cause every believer to squirm just a bit, Right? Am I, am I really committed, fully committed, radically committed, totally committed to Jesus? Am I really committed to him in that kind of way? Have I really denied myself? Am I willing to die? Honestly, probably not, right? That's our goal. That's our target. He calls us to a, a loftier commitment than just a casual acknowledgement. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. He's a pretty cool figure in history. We're probably not all there yet. We're, none of us are probably there yet, right? Probably not as committed as we should be. The fact is that is the target, right? To be fully committed, fully committed to Jesus. And statements like that, it's like, oh, why do you have to say that? Couldn't he just say, if anybody wants to be my disciple, Go to church three times a week. That would be reasonable, wouldn't it? I mean, that seems pretty radical, doesn't it? It seems to run much deeper than that. Have we honestly counted the cost of following Jesus? Today's parable, again, challenges us along those lines. Luke chapter 14, we're going to look, we call it a parable, and it is technically a parable, but really it's Jesus is making a point and to make that point, he uses two illustrations. You're, if you're using your outline on the back of your bulletin, it's just very repetitious. I'm going to give you a heads up. Very repetitious, times three. 
The illustration of, of a, a man building a tower, illustration of a king who might want to go to war, and an illustration of you and I who might want to follow Jesus. In this parable, Luke chapter 14, Jesus addresses the cost of discipleship. If you would, follow along with me, Luke chapter 14, verses 18 through 32. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to, uh, to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether or not he was able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. And then we're going to look at verse 33 kind of the conclusion, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Ugh, there's another one of those statements. Let's take a look at this. Are you ready? First point, the context. The context of the parable. We're looking at that, all these parables every week. What is the context? Where do we find this teaching of Jesus this word picture, the illustration, we call parables, the context of the parable. Well, look at verses 25, 26, 27 of Luke 14. Now a great crowd accompanied him. Great crowd, a whole lot of folks gathered. Yeah, look at what Jesus has done. He's healing people, he's feeding people. Great crowd accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, wait for it, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Ugh. Says it again. The cost, the radical cost of discipleship. Large crowd gathers around Jesus, all that he's been doing. They said, hey, can we tag along? Jesus said, well, I mean, of course you can. But all I ask is that you, you hate your family and you hate your life. What's up with that? Jesus, I think, is getting their attention. I'm going to guess Jesus has our attention. Where is he going with that? I want to follow you, Jesus. Fine, come along. You just got to hate your family and hate your life. Jesus said, you sure you want to do that? You sure you want to follow me? Very succinctly, the context of this parable, Jesus' teaching about the demands of discipleship. Jesus is teaching about the demands of discipleship. The radical cost of discipleship. What's up with this? You got to hate your father, mother, brother, sister, aunts and uncles, grandparents, I don't know, the whole, the whole, the whole slew, right? The whole clan. And you got to hate your life. What's up with that? Interesting. Luke recorded back in Luke chapter 6, verses 27, again in verse 35. I say to you, love your enemies. So is Jesus really teaching that we must hate our family and love our enemies? Now, skeptics of Christianity will, will say, yeah, see, yeah, none of that makes sense. It's um, contradicting himself. If you're at all, if you just have a curious familiarity with Jesus' teaching, you realize Jesus is saying, you want to follow me? You've got to love me. You've got to love my plan, my direction, my authority above 
all other in your, in your life to include your life. Does that make sense? A truly desire to follow Jesus? What if a family member says, well, yeah, we're not having anything to do with you. If you want to follow Jesus, we're not, we don't have anything to do with you. I know, I know several individuals personally whose family disowned them because of their commitment to Christ. Jesus said, you really want to follow me? What, what, if your, what if your wife, your husband, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your children, what if they say, yeah, we don't like that. We don't like that. Are you still going to follow me? Will you still follow? I mean, you say that a love for Jesus can look like, hear me, a love for Jesus can look like hatred to others. Uh, I've experienced this in my life. Maybe you have too. Oh, oh, you just hate me now. You don't want to hang out with me. You don't want to do what you were doing before with me, right? Love, does that make sense? Yeah. Love for Jesus can look like hatred to those separated from him, those outside faith in him. But let me, um, let me make clear, I fully, I fully believe this, that we can only love others properly when we if we love Jesus supremely. We can only love others properly when we love Jesus supremely. Does that even make sense? Yes, when we love the one who created us, we know what he has for us. We know what he has for them, our loved ones. We know what he wants for them, what he wants of them. Only then can we truly love people. To love, truly to love someone is to want God's best for them. I believe, right? We're all made in God's image. After his likeness, to love someone properly, we need to know the one that created them. Again, does that make sense? Yeah. So to love Jesus for some, like, oh, you must just hate me now. You don't want anything to do with me. Jesus is teaching about the demands, the radical demands of discipleship. Are those kind of radical demands? I would say, right? On the surface, I would certainly say, you got to hate your life, hate everybody in your family. No, to put Jesus supremely, it'll look like everybody else is on second shelf, right? If you will. To follow Jesus, you might not be able to go where you want to go all the time, right? Jesus, I'm following you, but I'm going to take a detour because I need to go over here. Are we following Jesus or not? Do we want to follow Jesus? To follow Jesus, we might not be able to go everywhere we want to go. Might not be able to do everything we want to do. The big meanie won't let me do what I want to do. Guys, he knows best. He made us, right? He knows what is best for us follow Jesus, might not be able to have everything we want to have. Big meanie. He knows what we need, right? He knows what we want. He knows what we want. We can take our wants to him. When we're following him, his wants become our wants, right? Jesus asking this crowd, are you good with that? Are you good with that? You want to follow me? You may not be able to go where you want to go. Might not be able to do what you want to do. Might not be able to have what you want to have. You good with that? And it might cost you your life. It might cost you your life. Just a little, that's in the fine print. Um, most of us didn't read that when we said yes to Jesus, right? Didn't read that. Oh, I didn't, didn't read the fine print. Let me say, the father gave his son. The Son, God the Son, gave His life. Never does God ask us to give any more than He has given us. Huh? God the Father gave His Son. God the Son gave His life. God is not asking us to give any more than He has given us. Many on this day that heard this teaching, many of them would be persecuted. Many would be imprisoned. Some of them would be executed, put to death, because of their following Jesus. Jesus asked the crowd, are you, are you sure you're good with that? Again, Jesus does not ask us to give sacrificially to him 
any more than he has given sacrificially to us. But he invites us. Listen, he invites us. You want to follow me, Jesus said? He invites us into something way bigger than ourselves. Way bigger than what I can do and what I can have. Jesus invites us today into what he is doing around the world that is having an eternal impact on eternal souls. He invites us into that, but it might cost us a little something, right? Are we good with that? Luke records Jesus' words in Luke chapter 9, verse 62. No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. No one after, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow Jesus, but oh, you know, I kind of wish I hadn't done this. I'm, oh, I, maybe, I, maybe I'd have been better off if I just stayed where I was. No one, after putting their hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus know, knew that this might cost us everything, right, to follow him. Will we? Are we willing to follow Jesus without looking back? That is the context of this parable that we're going to look at. Big crowd gathers around. Hey, Jesus, can we tag along? Jesus said, sure, but it could cost you something. It could cost you a whole lot, right? We're, we are assured today that there are more people that are being executed for their faith in the last century than the previous 19th century, 19 centuries of Christian history. That's astounding. That's just an astounding number that strikes our ears with a, that can't be true. But missions organizations assure us of that. The context, Jesus is teaching the crowds, his disciples, and those that are interested, those that are hearing, those that have been seeing what Jesus has been doing, they're saying, hey, can we tag along Today, we ask ourselves, do I want to follow Jesus? Jesus gives these two illustrations, kind of co-parables. I just made that word up. Um, I mean, illustrations that put together, we're going to call it a parable. Parable of the tower builder and the warring king. For a second point we want to make, an illustration from construction. An illustration from construction. A builder. Again, uh, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, he began to build this this thing and, and wasn't able to finish it, make fun of him and all of that that goes on with that. Again, the rest of your, this outline is just the repetition that Jesus is making. First, a builder must decide what to build. A builder must decide what he's going to build. What are you going to build? Well, here, imagine you're going to build a tower. What kind of tower? A watchtower for security. Need to build a watchtower because there's been folks sneaking onto the property from this direction over here. We need to build a watchtower. We don't know. It was a tower. Was it a storage tower for, for grain or something? Take care of your commercial business because we, we got grain overflowing in piles and we got to put it in a tower. We don't know. This man had to decide what to build. He wanted to build a tower. Builder must decide what he needs. What do you need? Oh, I, I need a tower for what, whatever purpose it might be. What does he need? Why does he need it? Where does he need it? He's going to make those decisions. Must recognize the need. I really need a tower. Have you ever had those days where you're like, I need a tower? He needed a tower. He's convinced the need was real. It was legit. I need a tower. I'm short on towers. Before he's going to move forward, he's got to decide what it is that he needs. Secondly, a builder must calculate the cost. Theme of this whole parable, he must calculate the cost. Once he's decided what he needs to build, I need a tower. 
to calculate how much it's going to cost to build this tower. How big is this going to be? The material costs. How, have you seen the cost of materials lately? Mm. Bad day to build a tower. Just saying. The labor costs. How much is... How much is going to be involved? How much time is it going to take? What kind of inconvenience? Building this tower, is it going to take time away from other projects we got going on around the place? All of that, he's got to calculate the cost. Can he finish it? Does he have enough to finish this? He doesn't know until he knows how much that tower is going to cost, right? Does he have what it takes? I need a tower. I need one right away. How much is it going to cost? I don't know. I got to, I got to calculate that. Is this, is this a real need? Do I really need a tower or just a casual desire? Wouldn't it be cool to have a tower over there? Um, kind of like, you know, I need a new pair of shoes or uh, I need a new car or I need a new cheeseburger. Um, <laughs> you know, have you ever had those days? And is this a real need or is this just like, yeah, it'd be fun to have another tower around the place? An illustration from construction. A builder must decide what to build. I, I, I need to build a tower. A builder must calculate the cost. How much is it going to cost to build this tower? And third, a builder must consider the potential outcomes. A builder must consider the potential outcomes. Because an unfinished tower, that's like as bad as it gets, Right? You ever, t you ever tried to build a tower and not finish it? Jesus said he's going to be mocked. He'll be, there'll be embarrassment. There'll be ridicule. Uh, wasted money, wasted effort, and an unusable structure. I'm not sure what a half a tower looks like. You'd have to tell me what the tower is going to be. And he starts to build this thing. He can't finish it. Imagine. Imagine. Or maybe some of you have experienced a, a half-built home on your block for decades. Imagine that. Somebody started building this house over here and they just quit. Maybe they ran out of money. Uh, I remember dec for decades in, in my young adult years uh, on the south side of Lincoln, Nebraska, where we're from, uh, there was this house, maybe Long Highway 2 somewhere, that was half, remember that? Half built. They, I think they ended up um, tearing the, the insulation ended up rotten and blown off and they re-insulated it but still never put siding on it. This thing was half built. I don't, I, I don't think they let you do that anymore. Uh, but for many, many years, remember that? And we'd drive by it and we'd ridicule the guy. Don't know anything about him. I have no idea what kind of tragedy had befallen him. But he started a house and never finished it. I mean, ultimately, I think he did. Decades in the making. Imagine half-built house and what people would say. So he had, to, he had to consider the potential outcomes. So let's take a shot at maybe three outcomes. Outcome one, he builds a tower, beautiful tower. Oh, it's the best looking tower you've ever seen. Like setting the bar for towers in that community. And it's just a huge blessing to himself and a huge blessing to everybody involved. Um, and you know, it, it, it made it on the cover of Towers and Gardens magazine. <laughs> beautiful tower. He builds this tower. One potential outcome is he builds a beautiful tower and it is a blessing. It does everything he wanted it to do and then some. Outcome two, possibly, potential outcome. Number two, he fails to complete it. It damages his reputation. His finances take a hit. Does a number on his business. Completely shatters his little ego. And there he is with a half-built tower. Outcome number three. He refuses to build it. No, nope, I, I just I'm not going to do it. I, I, it's going to cost too much. I just don't think I've got what it takes. And one day he wishes he had built it. Man, I sure wish I had built that tower, right? Leads to regret, anguish. I wish I had built that tower. I didn't. Illustration from, from construction. A builder. A builder has to decide what to build. 
The builder has to calculate how much it's going to cost to build that tower. And third, a builder must consider the potential outcomes, right? Parable 1A, illustration A of the parable of two <laughs> illustrations. So we've got our third point, an illustration from a palace. Illustration from a palace. Verses uh, 31, 32. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. An illustration from a palace, a king. A king's got somebody rattling his cage, threatening to come, mix it up with him. First, a king must decide who to battle, when to fight, when to deliberate, right? King's got to decide, are we going to go to war with these folks? Are we going to try gentler diplomatic means? When to fight, when to deliberate. Sounds like maybe this decision was forced upon him, said uh, another king that's coming against him. He's got to decide, should we go to war? Hopefully settle the matter for good. His pesky kingdom keeps bugging us. Let's go to war with them, take them down and enjoy the victory. Or shall we maybe pump the brakes and, and send a delegation to deliberate some kind of treaty, maybe buy us some time, maybe spare the kingdom, right? Secondly, a king must calculate the cost. Did I mention this is going to be repetitious? King's got to decide who to battle, who to battle, who not to battle. Yeah, we're not battling those guys. Yeah, we might battle these guys. We would love to battle those guys. You got to decide. The king must calculate the cost. He must calculate the odds of winning a war. These guys are coming against us. Let's see, we've got our 10,000. They have 20,000. But then take a look at our resources. Well, we've got these resources. They have those resources. If he wins, how many warriors might he lose? At what point? Is it no longer worth it, right? All those kinds of decisions. That's pretty hefty stuff here more so than building a tower, I would say, right? For a king to decide, should I send my men into harm's way? Is it going to be worth it? How many might we lose? Is that going to be worth the efforts? Perhaps wiser option be to utilize diplomacy. We're going to send our brightest and, and, and go... Talk with them, hey, hey, could we come to some kind of terms? Could we strike an agreement? Hopefully live to fight another day. The king's got to decide who to battle. A king's got to calculate the cost. Third, a king must consider the potential outcomes. What might happen? What could possibly happen? I've got to make a decision here. What might happen at what cost? Let's take a look at four outcomes that I just came up with. Outcome number one, you go to war, it's a lot of loss of life, you, you, you lose the war, loss of life, loss of status in the world of kingdoms, loss of your own kingdom possibly, you're overthrown. Outcome one, you go to war and lose, not good. Outcome two, you go to war and win. But you still have a loss of life. But you've got a new, renewed respect. You're not going to back down. You're going you're to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You save the kingdom. Outcome number three. You send a treaty. You sign a, a treaty. No loss of life. But you might surrender your people in your kingdom into the hands of another kingdom. But that you won't lose life, probably. Outcome four, you sign a treaty. There's no loss of life, 
and you agree upon terms where you're both happy, you're going to save your people, save your kingdom, both sides are happy, right? Huge decision, huge decision. So many factors, so many variables, life and death, right? Wisdom is desperately needed to make the right choice. Man wants to build a tower. Ah, build a tower, don't build a tower. I know there's some consequences. A king wants to go to war. Oh, big consequences, right? Big consequences. Huge decision. Stakes are high, life and death. Illustration from construction. Man wants to build a tower. Illustration from a palace. A king decide whether or not they go to, want to go to war with someone who's giving them fits. And then number four, the conclusion. The conclusion of the parable. Verse 33, so therefore. This thing's all funneling into. A man wants to build a tower. He's got to figure out how much it's going to cost. A, man, a king wants to go to war. He's got to figure out how much it costs. So therefore, verse 33, any one of you who does not renounce all he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus, could you say it a little more clearly? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm catching what you're saying. Those are words that, that terrify us to the core of our souls, and yet also make us say, thank you, Jesus, for being straight with me, huh? Thanks for shooting us straight. So therefore... Any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So therefore, here's the radical demands of discipleship. Could we use that same pattern that Jesus has established with the builder and the warring king? Let's do it. Number one, we must decide if we want to follow Jesus. We've got to decide. Jesus gives this invitation, come, follow me, follow me. All who are weary, burdened, heavy laden, come and I will give you rest, right? We must decide if we want to follow Jesus. This Jesus who came, this Jesus who died, this Jesus who rose to life again calls us to follow him. Will we follow him? Will we follow him? I'm going to make that decision. Do I need to follow him? Do I really need to follow him? What's in it for me? Jesus says, come, follow me. I say, okay, so how's this going to play out? What's in it for me? Bill Bright, a generation ago, came up with what we now call four spiritual laws, right? One, God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. Two, you've sinned and your sin is separated from uh, you from God. Three, Jesus died for, uh, for our sins. Four, we must repent and believe. We must repent and trust in him. Uh, we, this, this is a form that we've acquired in the last year. Uh, a little booklet, Four Spiritual Laws, Bill Bright's Four Spiritual Laws, with kind of explanations. And if you remember, we were joined with other churches and we, we put these in every single home in our, in our zip code, 10,000 of these, right? So we've got 10,000 some, and we uh, still got some on the back table. And listen to, um, again, spiritual principle, number one, four spiritual laws. Uh, God loves you and created you to know him personally. He has a wonderful plan for your life. Guys, I believe that. I believe that with all of my heart. God made me. He's got a wonderful plan for my life. But I think we need to explain to people what that wonderful life might look like. People say, well, what about Paul? Did he have a wonderful life? Yes, he did but it had some hiccups, yeah. right? Again, many that Jesus, this crowd that Jesus is dealing with, calls them to follow him. And yet, many of them would give their lives. 
Paul said, all, all that I had, Philippians chapter 3, all that I had, all that I've accomplished, all that I've acquired, it's just but rubbish compared to following Christ, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Did God have a wonderful plan for John and James? Peter gave their lives for him. Yeah, he had a wonderful plan for their life. But when we tell people, hey, follow Jesus, he's got a wonderful plan for your life. Maybe we ought to explain what that kind of might look like, right? The, the fine print, if you will. Everywhere Jesus goes, he calls people to follow him. How have you answered that call? How have I answered that call? Do I really need to follow Jesus? Do we truly need what Jesus offers, right? Am I in the market for a savior? Do I really need a savior? Can't we find what Jesus offers somewhere else? Trick question. No, you can't find what Jesus offers anywhere else. He alone. He, I agree with Peter who said in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is no other name. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Nowhere else do we find salvation but in him. Can't we find what Jesus offers somewhere else? No, we cannot. We must first decide if we want to follow Jesus. Jesus, I see what you have for me. I desperately need forgiveness of sin. I want to follow you. Secondly, we need to calculate the cost of following Jesus. Anyone who does not renounce all that he has, what does that look like to renounce all that, all that we have? Here's what I think it looks like. It looks like, Jesus, I will follow you. I don't care who says I shouldn't. I will follow you. I don't care what the consequences are. I will renounce in that sense of, I will follow you no matter what anyone says or what anyone does. Amen. Unless we renounce all that we have. Are we willing to follow Jesus even when it costs our family? How precious is our family, huh? How precious are our friends and family? But are we willing to follow Jesus if someone in our family or friend group says, yeah, I don't think you ought to do that. I don't like you doing that. Are we willing to follow Jesus if it maybe costs us money? Well, I was going to spend it on this, and Jesus wants me to help with that. Are we willing to follow Jesus if it costs us our reputation? Are we willing to follow Jesus if it costs our life? May I say, I don't think there's any such thing as a casually devoted follower of Jesus, right? There's no casual devotion to Jesus. We're either fully surrendered to him or we're not. I don't know if you agree with that. Chew on that a minute. Discipleship. Discipleship is pursuing, pursuing this place of total surrender to the person and purposes of Jesus. Discipleship is pursuing a total commitment, total surrender to the person and purposes of Jesus, regardless of the cost, huh? Radical commitment. Again, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, everything I've accomplished, everything I've got, it's all worthless compared to following Jesus my Lord. Today we're, we're in this time uh, where this uh, current um, deconstructing uh, movement, I guess you could call it. Uh, so very popular, we're well-known, successful pastors, uh, church leaders, worship leaders, Christian music artists are, are saying, you know what, uh, I'm no longer a Christian anymore. Yeah, I, I've been a Christian my whole life, or I've been you know, this or that, and yeah, you know what, I'm no longer a Christian, no longer following Jesus. And very, I don't want to oversimplify that. Very complex, all kinds of nuanced things. Oftentimes as well, I was hurt really badly by church folk. How sad and common is that? Uh, 
But you know what I think the core of it is? I mean, and, and I don't know every situation, obviously, but those who have written about their deconstruction, uh, those who have spoken publicly about their deconstruction, there seems to be this theme of Christianity just isn't cool to the culture anymore. It's just not popular to be Christian anymore. You get biblical ethics, biblical morality is no longer popular in our culture today. So you know what? It's just too uncomfortable for me. I think, again, very complex. I don't want to oversimplify it. But I think at the heart of that is it just costs too much. I don't want to pay the price of following Jesus, standing on his principles. Does that make sense? Again, very complex issue. I think the cost is too great. Uh, you know, that people make fun of me. They ask me questions about, do you think this? You think God's okay with this? You think God's okay with that? And I'm just tired of answering those questions. And I got friends that live all different kinds of ways, and I just don't want to be the bad guy in this, in this friend circle. And so, you know what? I give up. We must calculate the cost of following Jesus. Got to decide. Want to follow Jesus? Got to calculate the cost of following Jesus. And lastly, we must calculate the potential outcomes. Right? The builder, potential outcomes. Oh, man, I might build it and be great. Might <laughs> fail to complete it and I'll be embarrassed. The king, I should go to war, but I'm not sure what's going to happen. So it is with the one who Jesus says, would you follow me? We must calculate the potential outcomes. Three that come to mind. Outcome one, refuse to follow Jesus at all. Nope, I'm not, not interested, not in the market for a savior, and spend eternity separated from him in a place the Bible calls hell. That's outcome, potential outcome number one. Nope, I'm not a taker, uh, not interested. Potential outcome number two, trust him to forgive our sins. And that's about it. Refuse to be fully surrendered to him. This, these parables beg the question, can I get to heaven if I'm not fully devoted to Jesus? Right? I'm not going to tell you what I think. Yes, I am. Begs the question, so is he saying he can't go to heaven if you're not fully devoted? Guys, the thief on the cross did nothing but say, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, I'm going to meet you today in paradise, right? You, you, want, to, you want to seek Jesus and, and ask him, turn from your sin, ask him to forgive your sins. Absolutely, you'll spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. Whew. But you'll be the most miserable person around. I believe the most miserable guy in town is the guy who says, yeah, I love Jesus I've, I've trusted him for my salvation, but I'm not really interested in living for him. I think that is the most miserable guy in town. He knows what he ought to be doing. Convicted. Oh, I shouldn't be living like Jesus. I don't want me to do that. Is he going to heaven? Sure, sure. Yep, Jesus will drag our wayward carcass to glory forever. But you're going to be miserable. The person who's like, yeah, I don't know anything about it. I don't just don't, I'm not even interested. They're happy as a pig in slop. But the person who says, I know Jesus. I know what he's done for me. He's forgiven my sins, but I'm really not interested in much else. They're going to be miserable. You tracking with that? Does that make sense? Outcome number three, you pursue a surrendered life, regardless of the cost, right? Regardless of the cost. And that outcome is the joy of discipleship. Jesus, I am yours. I'm going to walk with you. I know you're not going to places where I want to go. I know you're not asking me to do things that I don't want to do. I know you're saying I should, can't have things I want to have, but Jesus, I want to follow you. And that leads to the joy of discipleship. Peter said it this way, 1 Peter 1, 8, leads to a joy inexpressible and full of glory. How about we pursue outcome number three? Fully surrendered. Jesus, I'm all yours. I've counted the cost. I know it could cost me everything. It could cost me a little something. But I want to follow you. I want to follow you. 
Because I'm kind of interested in the joy that comes in this life, not just in a life to come, right? How goofy is it that we say, oh, one day, one day, it's just going to be one day in glory and the great by and by, there's just going to be joy, overwhelming. But for right now, life really stinks. What, what, kind of, what kind of way is that to live? How about we follow Jesus today and embrace the joy of discipleship, huh? Renounce everything. Yeah, nothing else does it like Jesus does it. And I'm going to follow him. So as we close, while following Jesus isn't always easy, it's not always cheap, it can cost us something, it's the only guaranteed path to true joy, to true peace, to true satisfaction. Jesus is calling us to be fully surrendered to him, to a fully surrendered life, to, den to renounce all that we have in that sense of I'm not trusting in anything but Jesus. Trusting him in every area of my life, my finances, my health, my eternity, and everything in between. Listen, I lied. Uh, listen, listen to fascinating, fascinating what goes on in John chapter six. And I will, I'll be done. Um, uh, John chapter six, all about this commitment, and he's teaching some hard things. Got a big crowd, same thing going on, big crowd following him. And he's saying things like, you know, I'm the bread of life. And if, if, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. Shock factor. Uh, again, skeptics of Christianity will say, yeah, Christians are a bunch of cannibals. I've, I've not met one. I, I've been in this Christian thing for some time now. Never met a cannibalistic Jesus just very clearly, again, if you know anything about Jesus' teaching, he's talking about identifying with him. His body will be broken for us. We've got to embrace that. His blood will be shed to give us new life. We've got to embrace that, right? So the end of chapter 6 of John. John 6, verse 66. I'm going to shut up. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. One of the saddest statements in all of Scripture. After this teaching about, guys, you need to be committed to this thing. There's no casual observers here. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, right? He pairs down to his, that, that core group, that 12. Do you want to go away as well? Everybody's scattering. You, you guys, are you going to leave as well? Is this too much for you? Simon Peter, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus, I don't, where else do we go? I don't know where they're going. They're not going to find what, what we're finding in you, right? I don't know where they're going, looking for whatever it is they're looking for, but they're not going to find what they find in you. Jesus, where would we go? You are the only ones, the only one, that holds eternal life, the words of life. God, give us the heart of Peter. The same Peter who said, there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Before he made that statement, said to Jesus, are we going to go? No, where would we go? Where else would we go? Where else would we find life? Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for the life that you offer us. Everything in our flesh, Lord, everything in our flesh says, I just wish it was free and easy. Lord, we recognize that spiritual life is neither cheap nor easy. We recognize what you have done for us, that you have given your all. We recognize that the world, the culture at large, isn't always crazy about our commitment to you. So, Lord, we are here today to say we are yours. Help us see what it looks like to be fully surrendered to you. Help us to see what it, what it looks like to renounce all that we have and follow you. Jesus, we, we want to know, we want to know. 
We want to know what it means to follow you, what it looks like to follow you. And we want to follow you above all else. Father, there's, there are so many voices saying, come on, do this, come this way, follow me here. Jesus, we want to hear your voice. We want to come and follow you. So Lord, would you give us grace to do that as we close this morning? Would you show us what it looks like to live a surrendered life fully devoted to you. And for that, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.